So I'd like to thank you all for coming to the George W. Shields Memorial Session on this final morning of the Metaphysical Society of 2021 meeting. Uh, thank you, Larry, for helping to put this all together. Um, before we begin, first couple of things to go through. First, some administration. Uh, as you no doubt know, I'm a member of the US Air Force. And as such, I have a quick disclaimer to read. Uh, the views expressed by me are those of the speaker, me, do not reflect the official policy position or metaphysical views of the US Air Force Department of Defense or the US government. Um, and then uh, secondly, um, we kind of went over the format briefly, but uh, Dr. Gurman will speak, uh, I'll give a response and Dr. Eastman will give a paper, I'll give a few comments. At that point, the speakers can put my response in the proper place uh, and return to questions for the audience. Um, finally, this is a memorial session to uh, uh, George W. Shields. And so I would like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Eastman for a few brief words. Okay. Uh, this uh, past year, uh, Don Vinny did a write-up. Uh, Don is very close to George. They did co-authored a book. And uh, I'm going to read from uh, Don's uh, review about uh, George's passing away. George W. Shields, born in April 1951, passed away in August 2020. He had been ill since November of 2019 after complications from a surgery that left him with a serious uh, attack of sepsis. He managed partial recoveries and was full of plans for the future, but a series of complications left him unable to return to life as, nor life as normal. He died peacefully, surrounded by his wife, Marcia, for, of 35 years and his family. George had recently completed this is with Don Vinny, The Mind of Charles Hartshorn, a critical examination uh, from, from Process Entry Press 2020. This came out about May of 2020. A work of which he was very proud and which he was able to see in print. In 2017, he wrote concerning his family, friends, and career, quote, I feel most, most blessed. My life has been so filled with unanticipated joys and dreams fulfilled. In many respects, it's been oddly perfect, at least perfect for me, unquote. George took a bachelor's degree in 1973 and master's of arts in 1975 from the University of Louisville. He received his, doc received his doctorate from the University of Chicago in 1981, where he wrote on Charles Hartshorn under Alan Donegan and David Tracy. He did postdoctoral studies at Oxford. At the time of his death, he was a faculty of the Comparative Humanities Doctoral Program and senior professorial lecturer in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Louisville, an institution he had served for more than 40 years. Dr. Shields was recognized by the University of Louisville Delphi Center for Teaching and Learning as the University of Louisville faculty favorite based on student nominations. He was also a professor emeritus of philosophy and environmental studies at Kentucky State, where he served for 15 years as chair of literature and philosophy and as interim dean of the Art College of Arts and Sciences. At Kentucky State in fall of 2000, he was elected university distinguished professor. He was, was author, co-author and editor of uh, eight books, including Studio Logica, an advanced appendix to Stephen Barker's classic, The Elements of Logic, and Process and Analysis, Whitehead, Hartshorn, and the Analytic Tradition, SUNY Press 2003, one of his many publications that attempted to place process philosophy in constructive dialogue with the analytic philosophy tradition. And may I add, if anybody who hasn't read or looked aware of process analysis, I highly recommend it. Um, he was author of over 120 articles and reviews in professorial journals, scholarly books, and conference proceedings, a specialist in philosophy of religion and American philosophy, twice selected as NEH lecturer at faculty training institutes and past president of the American Academy of Religion Southeast, AAR's largest division. He was a recipient of a Templeton Award for science religion courses. And during his tenure at Kentucky State, he received more than 400,000 competitive grants and monetary awards from NEH and other groups. Those of us who knew George as a colleague knew him as one of whom life and thought were never far apart, always eager to explore the world of ideas, knowledgeable as a diversity of perspectives, generous in his disagreements, expert in the formulation of arguments, attentive to the aesthetic depths of experience. He was a musician, creative in his solutions to the problems of religion and philosophy, and ever effacing and witty, in the true sense of a word, a philosopher, a friend of wisdom. And may I just suggest one minute a brief minute of silence and meditation as I ring this Buddha singing bowl.
Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That was very much appreciated. Um, to turn now to uh, the philosophy that he would have loved to be part of here, uh, Dr. German, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And thank you very much, Professor, for uh, those kind words. I also want to thank Professor Cahoon uh, and the whole MSA staff for organizing the memorial session for Professor Shields and for the conference itself in such interesting times. Um, I'm going to share a slideshow in order to uh, relieve some of the tedium of hearing my voice all the time. Can you all see it now or see something? Yeah, OK, very good. The, uh, the guiding question of my paper is an old one, and we could approach it this way. I'm, I'm willing to wager that few contemporary scientists have even heard of uh, Albertus Magnus or of his statement that opus naturae, opus intelligentiae est, meaning that work of nature is the work of intelligence. But although this statement was is essentially as Aristotelian in, turn, in tone, a scientist wedded to the project of mathematical physics must believe this statement to be somehow true, though no doubt in a manner very different from an Aristotle or an Albert. What we're at a loss to explain is what it is that exactly makes nature intelligent. And I investigate this problem through quantum mechanics because it is there that asking about the relation between the object of scientific research and the methods of that research has finally become so acute as to be unavoidable even for physicists who would otherwise be inclined to you know, send philosophers packing if they just could. Like it or not, the quantum revolution has left us quite unsure what the objects are which we study in mathematical physics and particle physics, whether or not our methods of access distort these objects, and what the relation is between those objects and those methods and the rest of nature, of which quantum phenomena are undoubtedly a part. So while the mathematical and experimental details of quantum mechanics are without a doubt spectacularly complicated, I'm not going to deal with them here. The philosophical questions they raise are relatively straightforward, although not for that reason simple. And indeed, they ultimately have to do with familiar Aristotelian themes, how to explain the intelligible face which nature shows us, how to articulate the unity, if any, within natural phenomena and within our sciences. So let's begin with a brief survey of the main experimental phenomena that are of interest to us, primarily what is called the wave-particle duality and its related measurement problem on the one hand, and also what is called the non-locality of certain phenomena in the subatomic realm. Don't let any of these uh, highfalutin technical terms frighten you. We're gonna talk about them in as direct human uh, concepts as possible. Our first two phenomena can be encountered through a simple experiment, simple but famous experiment. A photoelectric plate can be set up uh, behind a screen that has two slits in it. Right? One can then shine a light source such that the light must pass through the slits in order to reach the screen, in order to reach uh, the plate behind the screen. Now, in the basic form of this experiment, we would see light waves propagate through both slits and interfere with each other, creating a pattern of light and dark bands on the plate. This is light behaving like a wave. But we can refine the experiment. We can fire one particle of light, one photon at a time, toward the plate with both slits open. Now we should expect to see not uh, an interference pattern, but a group of dots behind the, on the plate behind either slit, since a particle, one particle, must meet the screen at one single point. Nevertheless, we find the same interference patterns. How can this be? Interference patterns are caused by the interference of wave crests and troughs with, with one another, and particles do not interfere in this way since they're not extended in space like waves. The photon must pass through one of the slits, such that if only one slit is open, there should be a band on the plate behind that slit. If both slits are open, we would expect to have two bands respectively, but we do not. Instead, the interference patterns again spread out across the plate from both slits. What is producing this interference? Do photons fired singly know that they have to line up in order to produce this wave light pattern on the screen? Here then is the fundamental indeterminacy of light's nature, the so-called wave particle duality. Now the measurement problem arises from trying to think about this. When one tries to experimentally determine which slit the photon actually passes through, the interference patterns disappear. If you put a detector on the slits, the interference patterns disappear and are replaced by collections of dots again. So when no direct measurement of the particle path is made, we find odd evidence of both the wave and particulate nature of light. When direct measurement is carried out, we get particles with determinate position. 
as I say in the paper, no longer version of the paper, the problem here is ultimately a conceptual one. We're, uh, we're baffled by the results, all right, but what we're really baffled about is where the line is between observation and result. The problem arises from our mediated access to these phenomena. Subatomic particles are not perceptible objects. They aren't even very small perceptible objects. They are objects which we must stipulate as our investigatory targets through the complex interplay of experiment and mathematics, which I describe on pages six and seven of my paper. They have the peculiar characteristic that only some of their observables are, obs are available to us through our experimental and mathematical apparatus. And what is more, measuring some of those observables seems to interfere with our ability to measure the others. The nub of the problem is found in trying to understand what happens when we apply the mathematical formalism developed by Heisenberg and Schrodinger in order to measure certain observable states of particles. Quantum mechanics enables us to represent all possible states of a quantum system, the so-called eigenvalue, using the mathematical construct of a Hilbert space in which vectors of motion can be plotted. With Schrodinger's time-dependent equation, we can then calculate the future values along which these vectors ought to develop. These state vectors, as they're called, represent the possibility that what they basically mean is the possibility of finding a given particle at a given position at time t x. Schrodinger's equation is a linear equation, which describes the wave function of these probabilities unfolding in a perfectly determinate stepwise manner over time, except, unfortunately, when our system is actually measured. Upon measurement, the probability of all other possible observable states drops to, or positions, let's say we're measuring position, drops to zero instantly, while at a single point completely random, as far as we can tell, the probability becomes 1.00. This wave function collapse directly contradicts the determined linear quality of Schrodinger's equation. Let's try to state the problem uh, in non-technical terms. The problem is that Schrodinger's cat or a Geiger counter or a human being who's doing the observing or whatever are all complex objects, which we describe according to the laws of classical mechanics. But then we also say that they are composed of subatomic particles which obey the laws of quantum mechanics. Now that word composed hides a further critical assumption, namely that the behavior and the laws governing the macroscopic object are ultimately explainable without remainder from the behavior and laws governing the microscopic components. The assumption of reduction, in other words, reductionism. Unfortunately, because the act of measurement is no longer clearly distinguishable from what is being measured, we find ourselves referring explicitly, explicitly to the macroscopic classical object, the photon detector, the Geiger counter, the scientist, when stipulating and describing the quantum states of the microscopic measured particles to which macroscopic objects are supposed to be reduced. Obviously, we're caught in a circle. What then is the relation between the wave function, let's say, and the system whose observable states this wave function is supposed to represent? What kind of work is the word representation even doing here? Are we representing the state of the observed system or the state of our observations of the system? How can a wave function represent something about a physical system if the act of measurement from which we extract this mathematical function, the wave function, alters what is being measured? These are questions Niels Bohr raises. Furthermore, and finally, there's another uh, phenomenon we have to attend to, the discovery of the non-locality of certain quantum uh, observables has upended, or at least it should upend, our certainty that we know what we're talking about when we say things like nature or the physical or the quote unquote cl causal closure of the physical. For the experiments inspired by John Stuart Bell's tremendous theoretical critique of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, those experiments have revealed to us that our usual truisms about the space-time continuum are evidently more limited in scope than we had ever imagined. An experiment can be set up to measure a specific particle state in such a way that if we are to return results agreeing with quantum theory, we're forced to conclude either that there are some unmeasured hidden variables which, which quantum theory is not picking up, or that particle states, certain particle states, cannot be localized in space. And it's the latter, in fact, that has been confirmed experimentally. The state of particle A traveling away from a common origin will demonstrably be affected by a measurement performed on particle B traveling in the opposite direction from the same origin, despite the fact that any influence here, any effect traveling, traversing this distance would require that the influence radiation, for example, travel from B to A faster than the absolute speed limit, the speed limit of light traveling in a vacuum. And nevertheless, this, and this involves us in all sorts of terrible 
you know, time travel paradoxes. And nevertheless, it happens. States of separate particles affect one another instantaneously, as though the space-time continuum did not exist. While some parameters of natural phenomena appear in space and time, they are not quite of space and time, or at least in the way we've generally understood it. In my opinion, by the way, Bell has unarguably earned his place in the rank of men like Galileo, Newton, and Einstein, even though he's less known than them, and it's unjust. For even though he seems what he seems to have discovered only holds in the quantum realm that is far below Planck's constant, his discovery has revealed an astoundingly different way to be natural. But I think we should dispense with all talk of the quantum world versus the classical world. Subatomic particles and quotidian uh, billiard balls are all part of one world, our world, the only world of any interest to us. The difficulty is that their mode of being, what the Greeks would call the tropos to uh, and our, our modes of access to those modes of being are radically different. We don't know how to render their relation intelligible. I argue that the currently accepted ways, well, I don't argue this alone, many have noticed this, the currently accepted ways of doing so, all of which are variations on the theme of reduction to basic laws governing the movements of basic constituent elements, those ways are rapidly coming undone. We need a different conceptual arsenal. And I think Heisenberg, Werner Heisenberg is right in looking towards the Aristotelian distinction between potential being and active being. But this is going to have some high, and for us metaphysicians, highly interesting opportunity costs. And those are the subject of the second half of my paper. I make two points there. First, thinking of matter as small bits of realitas, is just too crude because as Aristotle says, realitas comes in different flavors. Matter is capacity, but capacity for Aristotle always means capacity for something, for form. We're allergic to the word form today, except as an epiphenomenon of matter. But quantum mechanics has actually substantially substantiated some of Aristotle's insight that form is nature, as he says in the physics. Form is nature more than matter is. Quantum mechanics succeeded where classical mechanics failed because it can explain the striking phenomena of atomic stability, which underlie all of our complex material structures by showing that atoms have an internal complexity of parts and relations and a holistic identity that is irreducible to parts. We do not, for example, as William Wallace pointed out, know the sodium atom by knowing that it's made of you know, electrons and protons and neutrons. We know it via the formal arrangement of its particle components. And this form in which electrons stand to the nuclear particles and to the other electron orbits is what distinguishes one element from another. Nevertheless, nevertheless, when we descend to the subatomic realm, we are not encountering things or entities whose form is immediately accessible to us. Rather, we are encountering entities indexed by a, an inexpungible lack of determinacy. An electron may have some determinate properties, it's static variables, for example, while it simply doesn't have other properties, it's dynamic variables, in the same determinate way that we think we usually apply properties to bits of perception. It is this very indeterminacy which enables electrons to be incorporated into higher level into higher level formal structures. This incorporation, I argue, is what we encounter in phenomena such as the wave function collapse. Observation and measurement of particle states can only happen, we have to remember, through the interaction of some one subatomic system, a particle flow, let's say, with another one, a, a Geiger counter or particle detector. In this interaction, the wave function of the observed particle is entangled with the wave function of the particles of something particular some observing instrument. Heisenberg is correct, I think, when he says that in this entanglement, a particle passes from potency to actuality in regard to some observable state. On the central point of interest to us then, Aristotle's insight served him well. Matter is nothing by itself, but it is never by itself. It's always in relation to complex bodies having matter. Hence elements for Aristotle are not elements because they're very small bits of anything but because they are the lowest level at which we can identify still a locus of capacity for being integrated into form, as Aristotle says here in this long quote that I put up for you from his meteorology. This capacity, as he says here, is harder to make out the further we get from the integrated holes of ordinary perceptual experience, but it's still there, still there, reaching out towards and capable of taking on form precisely by virtue of its relative lack of determination. Subatomic particles are not determinate objects, what Aristotle would call a todeti, this thing here that we can point to. They are the sine qua non for anything being a todeti. Any perceptible being is a matter form composite, a sinolon. In order for anything to be the matter of such a sinolon, it must have at least a basic capacity to do or undergo 
And the actualization of this capacity is to a degree measurable, although we don't quite understand how, in subatomic phenomena. In quantum measurement, we are watching dynamis take on an actual and measurable determinacy of some kind. Now, as any student of Aristotle knows, however, the distinction between dynamis and energia and dynamis and energia has system, systematic implications across Aristotle's whole corpus, including in what we might class today as metaphysics and epistemology. And I believe that these can illuminate the relation between modern scientific explanation and its objects, which worried Heisenberg, as we see in his quote, where he warns that in science, he means in contemporary science, the object of research is no longer nature itself, but man's investigation of nature. Now, what's, what's the problem that he's hinting at there? He's hinting at the problem of how, in fact, do we know that nature, how, how in fact do we know nature in the subatomic realm when our access to it is so indirect and mediated and where determinacy of any kind is so attenuated? What makes our investigations investigations of nature rather than distorting impositions upon nature? In expanding upon the relation of elemental matter and potency, which I quoted earlier from Aristotle's meteorology, Aristotle says something very strange to modern ears in a, in diff in a different place. Uh, he says, a quote from Metaphysics Book Zeta, that it is clear that most of what seem to us to be usiai are actually potencies, the namis. <clears throat> Not only the parts of animals, but also earth and fire and air, since none of them is one, but just like a heap until some one thing is born, genita, or ripened out of them. Now, his speaking of ripening in birth, Aristotle is indicating that potencies are actualized. They become unified most completely and thus become something most completely. When incorporated into that kind of being, which is itself most unified and determined. To be in the fullest sense for Aristotle is to be an usia, a mode of being that can take on ever new determinacies while actively maintaining a complex identity through change. And it is living beings that exhibit this mode of being most fully. They are usia most of all. Aristotle tries to think together systematically what our sciences tend to file in separate drawers, being as such, being an element of or a capacity for something, and being a certain kind of something which displays the ability to maintain its identity. That's the import of my analysis in the paper of Aristotle's statements that what is in potency and what is in activity are, when understood correctly, one thing. Aristotle is arguing that the unity between matter and form potentiality and actuality is most visible in living things because in organisms, the incorporation of potentiality is so complete that the material elements can't really be articulated at all without reference to the whole organic form. For example, in the quote we have here, animal organs are for Aristotle, Hile looked at from a certain point of view, their matter, but they will be perfectly unintelligible when looked at without reference to their functional role in the animal life of which they are organa, tools. And the same goes for the constituent parts out of which such organs are made, flesh, blood, bone. No one of these, no one of these is articulable by itself without reference to the form, the energia of animal life of which they happen to be a part. But as uh, Arya Cosman uh, argues in the quote displayed here, these Aristotelian distinctions are evidence of his deeper philosophical sensibility, which sees all of nature from the elements on up as a natural structure for the potentiality of animal life. It is specifically in living things that we can discern most completely the universal ontological operator and being at work. Thus, elemental nature can be said in a sense to be an anticip anticipation of the paradigmatically active being of Usia. Nature is mainly life. Uh, this uh, Professor Halper's paper, those of you who heard it on Friday, made me think of this. Nature is mainly life. And this isn't a quantitative question of what there is more of out there, lifeless or enlivened nature. Nature is ma mainly life because it's paradigmatic. What is crucial to realize is that this same structure, this continuum of anticipations can be identified in the soul. Intellect or nous, and this is, I'll conclude with this. Intellect or nous, the capacity to grasp intelligible structure is embedded in all forms of human thinking including those which make possible the work of mathematical physics. But nous, too, moves from, potentiality, from potentially thinking, sorry, to being actively at work thinking. In this, nous is a manifestation in the soul of the same natural activity by which potentiality is formed into the determinate, actualized wholes given to us in perception or intellect. Take the energia of being a dog. This, for example, is its activity of maintaining its self-organizing canine form. Now, according to Aristotle, the, in the intellective act by which I know the dog, 
The same energia at work making the dog what it is, operates directly on my noose, grasping it as what it is. This is what knowing and sense perception mean for Aristotle, perception or intellect becoming the form of what is perceived or thought. Here, the object known is a determinate energia, being a dog, while the capacity of knowing is the dynamis or the capacity to take on the determinacy of what it is to be a dog in the act of thinking. One final reflection though. What of the fact that a dog, qua possessing an intelligible form, is a potentially intelligible being? Now this is a fact we have to reflect on for it has implications well beyond the dog itself. For Aristotle is quite senseless to speak of potency without its corresponding activity. Potencies are always potencies for some activity. A dynamis is always a dynamis for an energy. The dog does not exist for my sake, nor does his existence imply mine. But the fact that there is potential intelligibility, no ability in nature, ontologically does imply the activity of knowing. The one can't be without the other, since the capacity, the dynamis of knowing, passes into active knowing, together with the dog, qua knowable, passing into the condition of being known in the intellect. There is then a certain sense, a deeply interesting sense, in which nature is for the sake of, or exhibits an internal organizing impetus toward being known. I think Charles Kahn, the Plato scholar, put this very well when he called the act of noesis, and he didn't mean just the noesis of uh, the deity that thinks itself, the act of noesis as the formal structure of the universe, sorry, becoming aware of itself. We may not be able to solve the problems of quantum weirdness, and certainly we will not be able to solve the non-locality of nature. These, Aristotle would find these phenomena as unsettling as we do. But I think that Aristotelian reflections can help us or can give us the language to try to understand how thinking could have access to these things at all. We have such access because thinking and being thinkable are two sides of a single activity. Note, however, that this will require sacrificing the hope that the appearance of intelligence within nature would someday be explainable as an accidental epiphenomenon of entirely blind processes. Some people may mourn this. I think perhaps Professor Dennett that was mentioned in uh, Professor Halper's paper would probably be one of the mourners, but quantum phenomena are so truly radical and odd and so deeply implicate the modes by which we study them that they leave us no choice. We're being forced by the internal dynamic of modern ostensibly anti-Aristotelian physics to reconsider Aristotle's insistence that being something is an activity, one inseparable from being knowable, while being knowable simply makes no sense apart from a further activity, actively knowing. Thank you, everyone. Sorry for stealing two minutes there, Dave. <laughs> My timing was off. Oh, that's, that's no worries. Let's see. Um, uh, thank you for that. So, um, in uh, my response, I, I I picked up a couple other things that were uh, in the paper that I don't think were in this uh, in this talk, but um, other ideas that kind of uh, popped into my head uh, as we were going through this. Um, I'm wondering about uh, the the aspects of quantum mechanics that are explicitly defined defining the limits of the knowability. Um, and I think that's part of the the elements of the uh, the quantum weirdness, if you will. Um, anyway, that's just a, a side point that I thought of on kind of on the fly. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, so I, I feel a, a bit of a loss as to how to critically respond to this paper, since the views it advocates uh, in many ways mirror my own with regard to um, formal cause as explanatory framework for. Uh, a type of emergence theory almost uh, was kind of what I pulled out of the, the paper. Um, and I certainly uh, agree what I take to be Professor Gehrman's underlying position that the Aristotelian formal ontology provides us an import, uh, with important insights to help us get a better handle on um, not just modern physics in general, but how we can gain uh, noble access to modern physics and how modern physics applies to our ability to know itself uh, in, in that way. Um, uh, so, uh, um, allow me to ask uh, to uh, respond to or to apply to a question that was that was put in the paper explicitly. Uh, the quote is, "What e what exactly is nature, the ostensible object of physics?" And 
uh, on page one. Uh, this issue entails, it seems to me, a fundamental core of uh, matter. How do we find the nature in which we call, uh, in which what we call physics obtains? Um, I think that we need to uh, explicitly and systematically define what we're talking about by by the term nature. Um, if we're going to say that this is the subject of physics, um, I, I I didn't find any express move in the paper to define nature, though I think uh, Professor German clearly suggests one. Uh, attempting as I read the essay to derive explicit concepts of nature based on the hints it supplies, I kind of ended up with two separate definitions that are not quite synonymous. Uh, the first applies to nature, capital N nature, uh, which German references in such statements as the intelligibility of nature and the unity of our sciences, or um, ostensibly we're being reminded that physics reveals only those aspects of nature that apply to the question we pose to it. And uh, so long as we remember the partial character of our physical picture of the world mediated through mathematical symbolism, we are proof against the mistake of confusing that partial picture with nature, big N, as such. Uh, these suggest to me the object of physics as an exact science pointing to the answer. Uh, at, so I think that that's the version of nature that um, is uh, is intended by the the question, what is the object of physics? Um, however, there there is another sense of the term nature that comes about through uh, through the paper and through discussions. Um, which is little and nature. Uh, the other sense of the term nature in the essay uh, is of characteristic or essence of a particular thing or event. This connotation occurs in such phrases as, quote, the greatest physicists in the world cannot agree on the nature of what they are measuring, unquote, or the non-local nature of some particle states. Um, so I, I would submit that perhaps, um, an explicit differentiation between those two definitions of nature, I think that are being highlighted uh, in the paper. And they're clearly in there. I think they just aren't explicitly stated as such. Um, uh, among the, uh, the recent papers that come to mind as we were going through this, uh, that might be of value towards developing this project, uh, one strikes me in particular relevance is called Experimental Test of Local Observer Independence by a group led by uh, Massimilio Peretti et al. Uh, and I will actually post that paper into the chat here if you want to do it. Uh, the study is a probe on variation of the quantum mechanical Gedanken experiment called Wigner's Friend as developed by Frauscher and Reiner. Uh, I don't have time to really go too far into the paper here. Uh, I can say it yields some surprising findings and make it clear the need for quantum ontology, um, essentially it comes out with this, this uh, if you kind of tweak the experiment properly, you can get an outcome that is contradictory in things that should be, um, uh, should not be able to be contradictory in the outcomes of an experiment. Um, so the experiment essentially directly contradicts itself in what the outcome is. And I will upload that. Um, I would also, uh, put forward the uh, that to explore the concept of the delayed choice quantum eraser experiment, which is a great name for an experiment, um, where uh, there's a kind of temporal the temporal efficient cause gets inverted in a certain way, and so you have what appears to be a going back in time to change your to change what happened previously based on the results of the experiment and how you measure something. Um, both of those, I think, uh, if you can kind of frame the, the Aristotelian approach as to applying to those experiments would be really fascinating. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I should go without saying, of course, that working out a neo-Aristotelian metaphysics of nature, one that proceeds by demonstrating the truths of first principles, uh, and invokes ontological distinctions such as dunamis and energia, uh, such metaphysics should be understood as provisional. Uh, so uh, this so far, at least as it invokes the authority of findings of the physical sciences, may be subject to radical qualifications, reinterpretations or rejections uh, based on new experimental findings. Uh, so some of these, these experimental outcomes are just kind of so weird that when I, I think any 
any ontological description, understanding, or framework that's used to try and give an explanation of how we interact with them uh, should just be, as a note of caution, um, seen as provisional. I think uh, as experimental go as the experiment or as experimentation advances, we kind of will run into issues that we'll need to reframe how we think <laughs> about the ontology of these basic concepts. Um, let's see, uh, let me hop to the end here. Uh, uh, so one of the note, the mathematics of various quantum theories can make clear the need to reconceive uh, what we understand to be ontically basal. This is a sort of metaphysical re uh, reorientation that occurs with revolutions in physical theory, Newton's ideas that the laws of earthly motion are the same as the firmament, Einsteinian uh, requirement that velocity, as well as a slew of other familiar concepts, such as simultaneity, are not universal reality, or as seen in Wigner's friend, that the events that we usually define as objective are not in fact so. With a quantum revolution, the meaning of objectivity shifts to the mathematically determinate quantum description of physical phenomenon, a description the ontological authority of which cannot be impugned for seeming counterintuitive. Um, so the, uh, the mathematical description, I think, is something that needs to be understood as more than just a mathematical description, but in some way an ontological description. And I'm very curious to see how um, the this can merge with an ontological framework such as the uh, the Aristotelian one, and I certainly think that uh, this paper and what was illustrated here is is a kind of good push in that direction. As um, that is kind of the the sum of my scattershot comments there a little bit. Um, before we turn it over for a response, uh, I would like to hand over to. Uh, Dr. Eastman, I don't want to take too much of his time to go through his paper as well. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, indeed, uh, just what you uh, had said about the uh, uh, the implications for uh, metaphysical analysis for these kinds of problems of quantum measurement as, as also brought up by the excellent paper of Andy German, uh, that was such a really good uh, introduction to the kinds of things I want to address. Uh, he leads up in Aristotle to the distinction of the actual and the possible, uh, which is really central to what I think is needed to resolve the problem of quantum measurement. And uh, that is now incorporated in uh, several efforts uh, recent efforts, uh, one of which is by the great uh, chemical uh, or, or, or quantum theorist uh, and chemist uh, Hans Primus in a book called Knowledge and Time, uh, where he makes very explicit about the distinction of the Boolean algebra, which he maps to actualization and to non-Boolean algebra the uh, for, for the uh, orientation to the description of the possible. And uh, building on that, then uh, uh, using a category theory approach, Mike Epperson and Ilya Sefiris, uh, uh, latter being a mathematical physicist, uh, and Mike Epperson, a philosopher of physics, uh, did this work in 2013, Foundations of Relational Realism, which builds on that distinction from category theory of the actual and the possible, which in a way builds right on Aristotle, but then maps it into contemporary quantum physics to provide a way to very simple, in a very commonsensical way to interpret uh, the, the basic findings of the core of quantum physics. And analogous to that, uh, Ruth Kastner does the same with a, in a way, a somewhat different approach, but a, a, theory, a, a possibilistic interpretation. So I, put all of those three together in combinations with some discussion of uh, systems theory and uh, metaphysical analysis and semiotics and uh, a few other elements in a systematic approach that I have in a book that came out this past December uh, on tying the Gordian knot, which I'll then put into the, uh, the chat af uh, afterwards. Uh, now, 
I did a paper with George Shields that was to be presented at the one year ago. And as you all know, that all got delayed. And so now uh, that's what is now being presented. And the uh, distinction of the discussion about, uh, as Andy so well represented of the input output, the observer observed those dual descriptions, then those are incomplete, fun fundamentally incomplete. And just how are they incomplete? Well, in quantum physics, we often have are sort of forced into not describing just the input output, or as David Finkelstein, a great quantum theorist would say, the input and uh, uh, outtake, not just output. Uh, the, the, that there is the input output context, the input output environment, that the environment for the measurement process is, is fundamental to the overall description. And that leads into uh, a point that George Shield and I wanted to emphasize that comes out of the combination of the basic logic, the and mathematics and in physics, illustrations of how we should think of triads, not dyads, but triads as primal. So the paper we have, we subtitled Purse's Logic, Category Theoretical Algebras and Quantum Physics. So what I'll read is just uh, brief excerpts from it, but please see the paper for, and further, I wish to have input about uh, revising it and making it, you know, getting it ready to send, submit for publication on behalf of George and myself. Uh, of all the, my name is just listed here, but it really is a paper from both of us. And George was first author as of last March. <laughs> uh, in my view, he still is. So Peirce's famous categories of first and second and thirdness introduced an important abstract schematic for philosophic and scientific explanation. As Hart Soren holds, this expansion from dyadic and dualistic explanations is a genuine advance in philosophy. And I might note that that confronting these philosophic and metaphysical issues is fundamental for being able to resolve the quantum theory of measurement. You just can't do contemporary physics in this for certain problems of this type without a combination of both the philosophy and the physics. So those people who just do try to do it from the physics alone are, I think, uh, uh, it, it's. Uh, it, Inevitably, they bring in some philosophic presuppositions that go beyond the physics. Uh, for instance, on the stalemate of the topic of internal and external relations that embroiled Russell, Moore, Bradley, and Boston Kett in long and technical debates is readily resolved by a trichotomous model. And entities are internally related to their causal paths, but externally related to their future entities. G.E. Moore's famous paper on external relations, for example, deals in examples whose muriology is entirely spatialized and tends to implicitly you know, set up this kind of simple dualistic framing. But in contrast with that, the person trichotomous way of thinking where the options are neither this spatialized option or something else exclusively, the dyadic options can always be embraced within a larger synthetic uh, approach. Arthur takes, let's see, uh, as early as 1880, Peirce was aware of the truth functional completeness of neither nor or negation disjunction, a function that is logically equivalent to Peirce's elation. Peirce's later logical research led to his anticipation of the highly asymmetrical Scheffer functions, effectively Scheffer's stroke or dagger. The dream here was to have a singular function which would have truth table completeness and encompass negation disjunction and or negation conjunction. The most definitive of functions, the only functions capable of defining all others in singular fashion are the Scheffer functions, which possess a triadic asymmetry that yet includes dyadic symmetry. Contrary to uh, Hume and von Wright, the mutual separability of objects or events is not entailed by mere distinguishability. In effect, a cumulative totality, A, a, a dot B, A and B, entails its parts, say A, but A does not imply the totality A and B. In the case, now mind you, it took to this, this set up in part in turn a technical expression, not just simply the term A and B. Uh, but A, in the case of entailment then, the quote conditioning is asymmetrical and the order matters. And this mirrors temporal inclusion and creativity. This kind of uh, lack of uh, symmetry is also reflected in the basic processes of quantum mechanics uh, in its uh, non-commutational -com behavior. 
Hartshorn takes Peirce to have attained a metaphysical generalization that will hold in all possible worlds. The ultimate metaphysical physical pattern here is symmetry within an all embracing asymmetry as embodied in Persian elation or is in Peirce's theorem. This is an ultimate concept at the depths of things is corroborated by two host arguments. Uh, one of them is the significance of Hilbert's completion of the positive implicational calculus. By the 1920s, David Hilbert was on the hunt for entailment and axioms that could prove all true uh, uh, as components of propositional logic. And he had pulled together four basic entailment uh, axioms uh, to do such a calculus, but, but it wasn't complete, uh, he was missing it. But when Peirce's logical papers finally became available in the 1920s, it was noticed that what is now called Peirce's theorem constituted the missing fifth axiom of Hilbert's calculus that completed the proof capacity and capability of the calculus. Now, what is important about this is that an asymmetrical function, the most clearly asymmetrical function that is non-commutative, that is AB is not, is not BA, that is that AB minus BA is finite, not zero. Uh, from the standpoint of truth tables or from an axonetic system perspective. That is, there's no such thing as a positive biconditional calculus. As Hartzorn notes, the biconditional is the model for symmetrical metaphysics where temporal process is not fundamental. And now we know from fundamental logic that doesn't work. And secondly, the person and logic of asymmetrical inclusion is found in all manner of satisfactory solutions to philosophic and scientific conundrums of Dennis, as demonstrated by numerous scholarly papers in the Persian, Whiteheadian, and Hartshornian literature. Several such solutions are based, based upon the work of Charles Hartshorn and contained in the uh, you know, really fine book by Don Vinny and George Shields that just came out last year, The Mind of, Har of Hartshorn, uh, Process Entry Press 2020. I recommend it highly. Overall, we envision a consilience within science and philosophy that is focused around the concept of asymmetrical triadic relations. What emerges here is the indispensability of some sort of at least a broad process philosophy, I might say in a way process philosophy plus a, uh, a, a generalization of se uh, semiotics. Um, the case in point is found in von Wright's treatise on time, time change and contradiction, which unwittingly contains a broadly white heading analysis of temporal process. Hartshorn considered, for example, von Wright to have produced superior arguments for the existence of quanta of process, which is what we actually have in, in, the, in the quantum physics. And adopting Peirce's triadic logic of relatives as the deep logical scaffolding of possible worlds or state descriptions enables liberation from the paradoxes of purely symmetrical external relations doctrines as found in human Russell that enables to all manner of problematic denials of protocols of deep common sense, ranging from our assumptions of day ray causation to our ordinary temporal distinctions of past, present, and future, to distinctions between memory and imagination, to freedom from what Santayana has famously called the skeptical solipsism of the present moment. As an example in mathematics, Mark Bergen provides a formal proof that the name set structure is the most fundamental in the universe of all structures. Well, named such structure is a fundamental triad. So that's an argument from mathematics of this kind of fundamentality. And then uh, I just going further into my, um, so the frequent effort of past philosophers to impose biconditional necessity to support the claim of determinism as an example had led to the common notion that effects are contained in their cause, causes a based based on entailments of classical me mechanics, uh, that is relations and necessity. This notion was also commonly held by philosophers of science well into the past century. But in contrast to this, as Vinnie and Shields point out, for Hartshorn, it's the other way around. At the most, most basic metaphysical level analysis, causes are contained in their effects. And then this triadic analysis, in a way that's what I'm arguing uh, occurs in this uh, quantum mechanical uh, uh, framework. Now, and then I give a critique also of the uh, way in which notion of determinism is often presupposed by many as being, being essential to science. Well, that, that's a metaphysical claim. And in turn, indeed, if you really look carefully at uh, even classical physics, classical physics, because you have to necessarily incorporate initial conditions, boundary conditions, and in any practical solution, 
is of deterministic form, but it's not determinism per se. So the notion of determinism as being embedded in and fundamental to science, even, even classical physics, I think is misleading. Uh, so it's a, it's a philosophical issue. And indeed, uh, I would argue that the failure of strong deterministic claims is pretty well established by the latest developments in, in, in our work with uh, interpretations of quantum physics. Uh, uh, maybe now to wrap up and to skip quite a bit that I have here, our argument that triads are primal correlates with the universality of the input output context triad in combination with the reality of potentia distinct from actual, you know, there's a mapping between potential to the non-Boolean description and actualizations, the order of the actual actual to the Boolean description. And you have to have to have both. It addresses both the distinction of epistemic non descriptions in quantum physics and the multi-level balancing of information and semiotic description needed to understand emerging complex systems from molecules to biological systems to human consciousness. This multi-level universality of input output context triads and triads in general suggest a generalization to multi-level information, both syntactic and semantic. That's the theory of information that came up yesterday. yesterday and that distinction is important. It, it's not just syntactic, it's semantic as well. In addition to fundamental triadic and local global communicative capacities in the real world, fully understood in both its Boolean order of actualization and its non-Boolean order of potential relations, that is potentia, as Aristotle brought out 2,400 years ago, and not just the truncated pseudo empiricism of actualism. So, so in multiple ways, the input output dyadic of classical physics thought and application are transformed into the input output context triadics of quantum physics and contemporary sciences, such as inform informatics, complex systems, biosemiotics, et cetera. And in several ways, as we've outlined above, building on the pervasive present presence of triadic forms in logic, mathematics, field physics, and fundamental quantum process, we abduct abductively infer from this radical ubiquity of triads that triadic structures are metaphysically primal, as well as critically important for all these many applications. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna try and condense my uh, response back to three hopefully coherent questions. Um, so uh, the first is um, uh, on page 10 of your paper, of the quote, uh, quantum physics always entails the evolution of potential outcome states that cannot be integrated in terms of classical Boolean logic to a probable outcome that can be integrated. Um, uh, unless the full measurement of context take into account, the proper evolution of potentia to probability cannot ensue. Um, Long story short, I, I'm confused about what that distinction is between potentia and, and probability uh, within the quantum state, um, what the kind of the ontological distinction between potential and I guess the way the uh, probability density function might be. Um, that's the first question. Number two, continuing with the theme of uh, potentials um, on page 18, quote, the contextual symmetry breaking that occurs upon each and every fundamental uh, quantum process bridges the order of potentiae as a landscape of symmetric quantum quantum processes in the order of actualization, um, which is the domain of epistemic descriptions. So there, there's a distinction between the epistemic, kind of what's epistemically available to us as actualizations and the potentiae. Um, but in some way, we seem to have access to the potential, those potentials and to that, that framework if we can make, uh, if it's truly outside the domain of epistemic description, how do we have any descriptive capability thereof? How do we predict the potential actualized outcomes, even though it's not specific, it's still um, predictable in cer within certain bounds of definition of predictability. Um, and yeah, so we still seem to have epistemic access to that potential, that world of the potential. And so I'm curious where that distinction is. Uh, and finally, on the, the, the question of the primacy of triads, um, uh, I'm curious about the, uh, the ontic distinction, such as 
pulling from Hegel's being and nothing that are kind of prior to separation. Uh, and the, the quantum potentiality would seem uh, to be a great example of this kind of cycle of uh, back and forth between being and nothing into becoming. Uh, regardless if you identify Hegelian, the mediation by context of the quantum triad seems to ontologically postdate the self other split. And so, yeah, that's pretty much the question. Um, how, how do you get to the triad as primary without having the self other differentiation first? So, let me uh, begin with the issue of the uh, between potential or, or potential relations. Uh, at, at, the, at this uh, most fundamental level uh, relative to uh, that form of access to potential of probability distributions and measurement. Uh, so in the fundamental quantum process, you have successive se sequence, in a way there's a sequence of four, four sequences, uh, but uh, more simply, I can just describe it as that quantum physics always entails the evolution of potential outcome states that cannot be integrated in terms of classical Boolean logic and then they evolve into probable outcome states that can be integrated in terms of classical Boolean logic. So at first, the Schrodinger's cat uh, is, you know, is sort of like open-ended. It's just prob prob probabilities. Then you, then you set up the experiment and you begin taking the actual measurement. And then there are specifiable uh, at the application of uh, alternate outcome states given the constraint and uh, the way you set up the particular uh, measurement, as in the, uh, the, the dual slit where you modify how you set it up and, and carry out your measurement, then you're transitioning from just the non-Boolean descriptions of, 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 of open-ended possibilities to probable uh, outcome states based upon specific measurements uh, given your uh, measure your 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 measurement um, and and the so the the potential are not directly accessible they they're only indirectly accessible but the probable distributions the out, the measurements the outcomes of measurements are are what we access uh, and so there's that so there's the transition from potential or potential relations to prob to specific experiments to specific out to specific measurements and the associated probable outcomes associated with that and most of our essentially all of our scientific descriptions pertain to the latter which is a, which we can work with a boolean description that measurement and science in its practice can always be handled by a boolean algebra uh, but uh, in terms of the adequate interpretation of quantum physics, we have to incorporate both the Boolean description and a non-Boolean description we're forced to in this interpretation problem. Uh, and that means that there's the indirect reference then to this uh, domain of uh, potential relations in addition to, uh, of, as in a, so to speak, a non-Boolean order, in addition to the Boolean order of specific actualizations. And, to affirm that it's nothing but the latter is actualism. And many philosophers or many scientists simply presume if the metaphysical position of actualism. Uh, and then one then is stuck with the many worlds interpretation. If you're committed to actualism, in order to understand quantum physics, you've got to have the many worlds interpretation. But if you back off and say, well, we really can have the combination of both the Boolean and the non Boolean description, both the actual and the potentia, uh, you can make a very commonsensical interpretation of all these quantum experiments uh, and, uh, and and not have to add any new physics to it. I'd love to have a sit down uh, with you at some point uh, to dive into some of this stuff. Uh, uh, Dr. German, I didn't know if you wanted to respond to anything or if not, we'll go directly into questions. Um, well, I thank you very much for the comments. I will um, say a few things about them. First of all, uh, I, uh, some of the comments I can't respond to until I've read the um, Wigner's friend experiment, which you mentioned since I uh, am coming at quantum physics as a philosophical ignoramus. So I have to, uh, but it sounds very interesting and I, I will read it and then promise to send you my response. Uh, with regard to the question of nature as the object of physics and what exactly we mean by that, I tried to um, write the paper 
with as deliberately, uh, I wouldn't want to say inexact, but um, loose conception of nature as possible on purpose. One of the reasons was I was tracking some of the uses of the term in the physicists, theoretical physicists that I was thinking about, Bohr and Heisenberg, for example. Heisenberg is more philosophically adept than Bohr. I mean, I, I, there's just no doubt about it. Uh, and Heisenberg is fully aware that nature, the object of physics, is in some sense um, what you would call capital N, a, a part of capital N nature, meaning na the object of nature as the object of physics is whatever sides of it answer to the questions that we've put to it. Uh, so which, depending on which window we look through, that's the face that nature is going to show us. And Heisenberg is quite aware that that's not necessarily the only face of nature. Um, he, nature as the essence of something, uh, little nature, I guess is what you called it, uh, does come into play as well, of course. And for Aristotle, that's perhaps in some way the main sense of nature. But I wasn't the paper tries to sort of start with the amorphous sense that physics, certainly for a realistic, a, a realistically oriented theoretical physicist, is, is not studying stories that we tell ourselves in our mathematically inflected stories that we're telling ourselves in our heads, but nature out there. And I'm perfectly content at this stage to leave that let the physicists, I'm giving them the rope with which to hang themselves here. Right? Let nature out there be whatever uh, they want it to be. It can be the essence of something. It can be nature as you know the, the thing that returns the answers to whatever our experiments are. Um, I work with them in a stepwise fashion on that score because I think that in many senses uh, for some quantum physicists, it's very difficult and I, I understand them to, to really answer the question, what is the object of nature that we're studying? Is it the essence of something? Is it uh, some other sense of nature that's much more amorphous and inexact? It's hard to know. Uh, so I was, was trying to start from there. Uh, with regard to your statement that non-Aristotelian metaphysical concepts or categories that we might try to employ would have to be provisional and subject to experimentation, I, I agree. Um, I'm not sure that that's as big of a problem for Aristotle as we sometimes think. Um, for Aristotle, we'll put aside the later development of Aristotelian philosophy and the scholastics and so on and so forth. Um, I, I think that, you know, were we to show Aristotle the, our astronomical picture of the world, which is obviously very different from his, he would certainly be, be surprised by the results. But I, I don't take that Th those results, which are, you know, the classic example of modern science demolishing an Aristotelian structure. For me, they've never seemed as metaphysically devastating as they seem to be for other people. I understand, of course, they have impacts. On, but Aristotle will always agree that philosophizing has to be um, subject to, has to be provisional and subject to looking again at the world and seeing what we think. It's just that he's also trying to explain how it is, in fact, that we look at the world. So those two things will have to proceed together. Those are uh, inadequate answers to your question. <laughs> no, it's, I, I've always thought that uh, uh, the problem with uh, Aristotle's physics was not the process of the physics that he tried to do, but that everyone just thought that he was right about everything instead of how he was trying to approach things. And right, right. That's part of the reception history of Aristotle that he yeah. uh, can't control because of the unfortunate fact that he can't live forever. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Anyway, I have a whole slew of questions that have been put into the uh, into the oh, chat, wow. so I'll try and run down these uh, in, in the short time we have. Uh, Wes, uh, did you want to uh, hop in? I believe I have you down here first. Sure, I, I'd be glad to uh, to get a piece of this action. Thanks so much to, to both speakers. I I um, let me skip the questions in the queue and ask a question of both of you, both speakers. Uh, it sounds to me as if generalizing somewhat from the presentations, the claim is that we need a reference to potentia and um, in some kind of active sense. And Tim, Tim's paper points to the, the need for, need for a non-Boolean analysis of the underlying potentia, vagueness plus non-Boolean character. I think that's a problem for Arist an Aristotelian approach, particularly the non-Boolean part. And Andy um, seemed to me to, to emphasize or at least imply the need for, for active potency, this traditional idea of, of, of really a, 
in, in a, almost a third category of active potential, the active potency, qua potency, but 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 with some act built in, and and that sense of power seems to leave some problems for purse. So I'm wondering if you two could put your heads together and talk about active potency and 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 uh, uh, whether I'm on the right track in understanding you and what you what you make of this. Professor Eastman, go ahead. I'll agree with whatever you say. <laughs> no, not, you shouldn't. So in any case, it, it strikes me when, when Andy described this wonderful description of Aristotle's thought, and insofar as I've read uh, you know, through via Heisberg, et cetera, you know, this distinction of the actual and the potential, uh, I thought that was very consonant with my understanding of the physics and with a need for a distinction of measurements, specific measurements. Uh, if you do the measurement on that uh, electron spin, it's going to be spin up or spin down upon measurement. And prior to the specific measurement, depending upon the arrangement of the experiment, uh, it really could be one or the other. It has a certain potential in, uh, to, to be one or the other. And once I frame the specific measurement, it's, it's going to have a certain probability distribution. And, and to characterize that potential within that overall framework in a systematic way, uh, now applying category th theory to this overall framework, we realize we have to use both the Boolean and a non-Boolean algebra to do this sufficiently. Uh, and I see, uh, it seems to me quite consonant. Uh, I think that's so. we just want to put in, uh, Tim, and say that that makes sense to me. But you know, in, in your in your reply, notice you're you're giving us a dyad <laughs> there, though, right? I mean, there's the act and there's the potency. Now you're putting the non-Boolean on the side of the potency, but maybe there are possibilities. Uh, but uh, but but you see the, the 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 but the reference of the of the of the, of the non-Boolean description. The 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 system we're talking about is yeah. inevitably a combination of input output and context input output and uh, uh, and and uh, the experimental setting so the relations of the input output and the the uh, preparatory experimental relations are are the triad. Mm -hmm. gotcha. it's, the, gotcha. it's the input output context. So there's never such a thing as sheer isolated input output. It, uh, if you consider in any scientific example I'm aware of, it's always an approximation. Uh, it's always a subset out of a broader, more complex description that input output context, in my view, uh, I've never seen an exception to this. There's always a laboratory setting. There's always some constraint. In fact, we pile, pour millions of dollars into particle physics ex to experiments to highly constrain things so that we can make it simple. It's exceedingly difficult to make nature simple enough for our analysis. And that extreme those extreme constraints force things into the deterministic framing or force them into a particular, you know, specific context that then we can ignore and look only at dyadic input outputs, but it's an approximation. It's a model, not the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. That's, 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 that's a lovely summary right there. Thanks so much. Uh, I believe the next one I've got on the list is uh, Tom Pashby. Sir, if you'd like to go. Thanks, yeah, so I, um, I had a um, brief comment about Bell's theorem, um, which I'll just leave in the chat. Um, I the, just read it, I, and I agree. You're right. I have to. That's you, what you said is correct, and what I said was wrong. Okay. We have a non-locality problem any way you cut the mustard. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, good. But yeah, my, the question, the thing I was interested in is, so I, I find the distinction um, between potential and actual uh, fairly, fairly straightforward to to cast in terms of quantum mechanics. But um, you, you seem to be suggesting a, a hylomorphic interpretation, and I, I couldn't quite discern how that maps on to our understanding of quantum mechanics. Um, particularly what Would you just say the first part of your question, what, what part seemed to you straightforward? The, the potential um, distinction that we've, we've been discussing. So that, sorry, that's not what the question is about. The question is about hylomorphism. So I was just curious about what you regard as the Aristotelian form in, in quantum mechanics. And I sort of- Oh, like I'm sorry. I, I mean, actually I, I'm more uh, willing to go with the straight, with the, what you thought was more straightforward, meaning the potentia and actuality relation. But if you want to talk about what I, what I suspect um, 
Aristotle would call the form in the case, let's say, of um, an atom as opposed to its potential, as opposed to its matter, um, then I would, I would probably use the example that appears in uh, William Wallace's book, which is called, I think I have it here somewhere, Modeling Nature, I believe, the example of the sodium atom. The form is the, is the ground state that an atom will return to, which, uh, you know, under, after pressure has been applied to it, it will return to a certain state of relationships between electrons, neutrons, and protons, and so on. That's how we know what a sodium atom is, and Wallace puts it very well. We don't know that by knowing how many, we don't know what a sodium atom is by knowing that it's made of, made up of electrons, protons, and neutrons, because that's just as true for any other um, element. We know what it is by the arrangement of them. Um, and it's when you, when you try to subtract from that arrangement and investigate the behavior of electrons uh, outside of their bounded relationship to an atom that you are already no longer dealing with, but you've gone below, I'm sorry for these geographical you know, descriptions, you've gone below the level of Aristotelian form in a sense. Uh, and you're encountering things that can only be described potentially. Now, when, uh, when I, I finally managed to scroll through here and see your question about Hamiltonian energy, I'm not sure how to answer that question, actually. I'm not sure, since I don't quite understand well enough the Hamiltonian energy that you're okay. Well, no, it seems to me that, that that's that's pretty much in line with your suggestion. That's that, what I said. Ground state was sure energy eigenstate of the of the Hamiltonian. So yeah, um, yeah, great, thanks. Okay, okay. And uh, I believe we have time for one more within the actual constraints of. Time frame, and then anyone else who wants to stick around for a while can. Uh, Dr. Hendrick, I believe you're you're up. Hi, thank you both uh, for wonderful papers. My question is for Andy. Um, I'm yes, not sure if you're able to read it in the chat, but um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how you understand language and the role of language um, in knowing and being knowable. Um, and I ask uh, our keynote speaker a couple of years ago, John McDowell, he's appealed to Aristotle uh, to develop his sense of second nature, which he understands as mindedness, um, which is acquired by means of linguistic initiation. So for linguistically initiated perceivers he, or minded perceivers, knowing is a two-sided coin, kind of similar to what I see you advancing at the end of your paper, one passive, one active, but both sharing the same conceptual structure, which means that um, something our thinking is constrained by something that is not unthinkable in principle. So I kind of take issue with elements of this account um, uh, of equating the capacity to know or to know that with linguistic initiation. Um, it, it has a rather bereft understanding of what first nature is, right? Or what you might more broadly have called in your paper animal life. Um, and that capacity to know or be known um, and its relation to how whatever you understand as form or conceptuality. So I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about this. So are you saying you take issue with McDowell's identification or almost identification of knowing with conceptual thinking, discursive thinking? Basically. Yes, yes. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I take issue with the same issue. <laughs> um, I, I think for Aristotle, to the, to the degree that I can understand him, uh, on this point, there's a very close similarity with Plato, namely that even our acts of discursive thinking have um, a non-discursive and intuitive element. I, I, you could say sunk into them the way Fichte describes, you know, the I sunk into the activity of I-E-Y-E, -E, right? That's, um, if you take that example, for example, that Aristotle has of a child at the beginning, children call all men father and all women mother. And then eventually they, you know, they slice the salami until they get right down to the correct application of the concept mother or father to the right person, instead of using father for everyone who has a deep voice and mother for everyone who has longer hair or whatever, whatever he was intending. What it shows you in that example is that uh, there is a kind of thinking going on. There's a kind of activity of news going on before language has fully kicked in and is able to carve up the world linguistically. We can carve up the world linguistically because we are already seeing differentiation. That when you look at a child looking at the world, he's not just staring empty, empty, you know, in an empty fashion at things. Look at a baby's eyes, it's quite clear. 
noetic distinctions are being grasped before they can be expressed. Um, Plato perhaps is in, in some odd way more clear about this in that he talks always about grasping the ideas as a kind of eye of the soul or that's open and just sees them, right? And we often say, well, Plato's language is metaphorical and so, but in some cases that may be clearer to understand because what he means is we have to see before we can speak. And there's an activity of seeing that underlies the very capacity to then speak and articulate and divide correctly and correct our mistakes what we call conceptual thinking. I think that's the same for Aristotle. And I think McDowell is, um, I guess as a, as a Kantian of sorts, allergic to admitting that, there, that we have some kind of intellectual intuition uh, because that would take him outside of the bounds of what he wants to admit. So no, I think first, what he would call first nature, thought is already at work in, in nature and in animals. And Aristotle even says somewhere, I think in the posterior analytics, animals have a kind of noose mm -hmm. in sense perception. The, the sense perception itself is an ability to carve up the world correctly because the world is carvable correctly. McDowell, for some reason, does not want to take that last step. Again, I think it's his Kantian loyalties that prevent that. And I, I think I take issue with the same thing you do. But... Great, thank you, that was very helpful. Cool. If I may add to that, uh, I think this last question and the answer is just wonderful and illustrates what I wish to refer to as context and that uh, kind of uh, linguistic reference and analysis that goes beyond simplistic actualism or Boolean description or simply measurement and analysis of measurement. That is a more holistic framing of the overall problem that we need to address both the science and these philosophic issues. Uh, that's why I think we need the philosophers as well as the scientists. Too often the scientists get stuck with their reduction or their uh, dropping everything down to uh, particular measurement outcomes and their correlation. Uh, this, so, I, uh, so I applaud the last question and answer as being a very great illustration of what I, uh, Partly why, as a scientist, I'm a cheerleader of all you wonderful philosophers. <laughs> so we're not out of work yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope not. I, 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 if the if the world were the right world, I would I would increase the budget of you you, you philosophers by a factor of a fifty and uh, and just leave it where it is for R and D. So actually, I, I have a, a question kind of along the lines of the the language because. Um, in the, the mathematics, or, so there's a question as whether you want to define the mathematics or identify the mathematics as a type of language. But um, in that case, lots of times it's building the language first and then uh, understanding the results of that, uh, the, the, what's logically entailed thereof afterwards. And that you, there, there's the... Um, the construction of the mathematical formalisms, which then have certain consequences uh, in the physical systems that are described by those math by that mathematics in terms of how, so instead of you see, instead of the child seeing uh, and kind of visually being able to make the distinction between uh, people, but only later able to apply the linguistic description. There's almost an inversion sometimes, not always, and but uh, with some ways in which mathematics is applied to physical theory. Uh, don't 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 ever forget that a mathematical model representation is always a model of. Of, some, of course, yeah. yeah, of course, no, uh, absolutely. But um, it uh, sometimes the the way in which that model unfolds then brings about the physical understanding afterwards the physical understanding oh i'm sorry i didn't uh, catch the last part of you. Yeah, i thought sorry. you meant that the, the way the model unfolds uh, affects the physical state of what's being understood I didn't no hear the end. but okay, yeah no, no, right. so right because the the uh there's maybe there's there's a built-in logic in the mathematics that's not there in pure linguistics and so there's kind of the unfolding of that logic which then is later applied to the physical systems that are modeled by that mathematical subject. So there's a kind of play back and forth. Yeah, I think uh, I think we're well past <laughs> the time. What, uh, yeah, session. what is it? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs>
uh, thank every, thank you all for for thank coming everyone. here to this. Yes, this has been amazing. Thank um, you very much. And uh, we'll see you all at the other uh, the next sessions. Indeed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.